Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of The One Thing Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Adam Rindy. I welcome on today Andrea Hardy, who's a GI dietitian out of Alberta, Canada. She is research-focused. She utilizes the latest research in nutritional science to apply that with her patients and her speaking engagements and some of the lecturing she does. She also is a host of a podcast called Let's Gut Real. I really enjoyed this discussion as, as we walk through the microbiome and how to mind your microbiome. We speak about topics such as the Mediterranean diet and how that influences the microbiome. We talk about how the microbiome ages throughout our lifespan, ways that we may enhance our microbiome through diet and lifestyle and nutrition choices. And we'll go into specific topics such as polyphenols. This is a enjoyable episode with a lot of practical application and gives us a further understanding of our microbiome and how to take care of it. Enjoy the episode. Stay tuned for some sh- notes after the episode. And I look forward to you giving me your feedback, liking this episode, and sharing it with others. Without further ado, we'll join the conversation in process. I'm here today with Andrea Hardy talking about minding your microbiota. Welcome to the One Thing Podcast, Andrea. It's great to have you on with us. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Well, I thought we'd get right to it and speak a little bit about the microbiota, but I want to hear more about your background. You have a lot of excellent credentials, and I know you're involved with a lot of things, but I'd love to hear how you came about to be interested in the gastrointestinal system and how you focused on that. If you could just share with us sort of your journey into this space. Sure. So I have been a dietitian for around 10 years now. And when I started my career, I worked in clinical. I primarily worked in the CVICU as well as uh, liver disease and then on to oncology. And throughout my time as an intern, as well as working as a dietitian, I actually became diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome myself. And back then, IBS was still kind of seen as that condition that was all in your head. There was a lot of stigma around it. Really, I was kind of embarrassed at my diagnosis. I knew there was something wrong with my gut, but of course, there was nothing structurally there. Everything had been ruled out. And so at the time of my diagnosis, it was kind of a learn to live with it, drink more water, eat more fiber, things that I already did as a nutrition student at the time and then as a dietitian. And so I kind of just followed along with the research as it developed, even though it wasn't my practice area. And there was a lot of great stuff coming out in later years through the Monash University about FODMAPs. And then, of course, the research around the gut microbiota started to explode. We started to understand more and more that functional gut disorders were really a gut-brain access disorder, and the gut microbiota had something to do with it. And so as somebody who also loves research, I know you two uh, love it, Adam, is really, I just dove right into it, started learning and became really interested in how the gut microbiota not only influences gastrointestinal disorders, but really a lot of other conditions as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I started uh, my career and kind of uh, became a big advocate for dietitians being gut health ambassadors or taking some of the research that is translatable and pulling it into practice. Yeah. And I guess I, from the outside, I'm not a dietitian, but I've observed how this has really become a specialty, like GI dietitians um, have sort of taken hold over the last, I would say, five to 10 years as a subspecialty. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I it's all I really have time to consume. I'm definitely not an expert in diabetes or cardiovascular disease anymore. Uh, Really, it kind of takes up all of my interest, all of my time. And I work really hard to make sure that I can stay on top of it. And it is hard because there's so much research coming out now. Yeah. I mean, all you have to do is 
open up a browser, <laughs> at least my browser, I get flooded with new studies daily on the microbiota and gut microbiome and all its interconnections with health. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how you and I connected. You had, you had recently returned from a microbiota conference and I was really interested in some of the things that you were learning there and I touched base with you and thank you very much for agreeing to kind of share not only some insights from the conference, but just how that furthered your already, un your already strong understanding in the microbiota. So I appreciate you for coming on, coming on with us and discussing that. And I thought we'd launch into some of the topics related to the microbiota. If you could just kind of give us an overview of, you know, sort of the generalities of nutritional influences on the microbiota. And just for people who don't understand what the microbiota is, we're speaking specifically about the gut microbiome. So if you could just give us a brief overview, and then we can start talking a little bit about the nutritional influences on the microbiome. For sure. So your gut microbiome is the makeup of bacteria, viruses, and fungi that live in your gut. And so as we started to discover that we had a whole slew of these microbes living in our gut, we realized that they actually often provide health benefits to us. So they support us in our health and actually play a role in keeping us well, as well as uh, playing a role in the development of diseases. And so we realized that the gut microbiota um, requires nutrition inputs to make sure that it functions well. So there's a whole bunch of things that influence the gut microbiota, but nutrition is the thing that often influences the microbiota the quickest, as well as it's the most easiest way to influence the gut microbiota. And that's because things that we don't digest make or way, make its way through the intestinal tract to the colon where the majority of our microbes live and then can digest it and go to work helping our health or potentially even hindering our health. And so in terms of taking care of that gut microbiota, um, I like to think of, you know, this little ecosystem of bacteria living in our gut. And every time we consume something or even a lot of our lifestyle habits play a role in whether we're taking care of that gut microbiota or negatively influencing the gut microbiota. So it's no longer just what you're doing to take care of your health. It's what you're doing to take care of your gut microbiota as well. <laughs> and so in terms of nutrition influences, at first we kind of thought, you know, fiber was the primary influence of the gut microbiota. But as research develops, we realize there's a lot of other nutritional influences as well. We're starting to kind of uncover that it's not only fiber that fuels those gut bacteria, uh, but there's also proteins, uh, fats different uh, food chemicals that also influence our gut microbiota too. And so we're kind of just starting to learn about how those things influence the gut, but we do know for sure that fiber plays one of the biggest roles. And I know in the States as well as Canada, most people really don't get enough fiber. And so Part of that theory involves, you know, as our fiber intake has decreased, as our diet quality has decreased, as our intake of whole foods has decreased and our intake of processed foods have gone up, um, we've actually um, changed our gut microbiota in a way that has negatively influenced our health and possibly is one of the drivers behind chronic disease, autoimmune conditions, and some of those other changes in health that we don't necessarily see in developing countries. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that's something you see a lot in your practice as well as a lot of increase in chronic disease and, um, you know, some of those autoimmune conditions too. Definitely. And, you know, I think we're looking for answers in the gut and looking for ways that we can prevent these diseases and also looking for ways that we can reduce the triggers to these diseases if they've already started to manifest. And yeah, so it's interesting you point out um, some of the uh, categories of proteins and fats and food chemicals um, that may influence the microbiota. I don't think a lot of people think about that um, 
and we're, we've been sort of zeroed in on fiber and prebiotics. Can you go into that a little bit more? Sure. So talking about the proteins and fats and food chemicals. For sure. So why don't I take a step back first and explain how fiber influences the gut microbiota? Because that's the mechanism we understand best. Uh, but basically, uh, certain types of fibers um, are non-digestible carbohydrates. So they pass the way through the digestive system. And when they land in the colon, those bacteria can go ahead and ferment those carbohydrates. And when they're able to ferment those carbohydrates, they produce beneficial metabolites. Uh, also, you know, the catchword right now is postbiotics, uh, such as short chain fatty acids that are known to help uh, improve our immunity, play a role in uh, gut integrity, provide energy for our body, and help to regulate some critical functions of the gut. So the gut barrier and the immune system that's found in our gut. And uh, so as we started to dive into research around fiber, we also started to look at um, how different uh, other food components influence the gut microbiota. So uh, specifically, there's been a lot of interest and uptake around animal proteins. So animal proteins can include things like our meat, chicken, beef, pork, uh, but also could include things like eggs as well. And so when we consume proteins, a lot of it is digested and absorbed in our small bowel. However, small amounts make our way, make its way through the gut undigested. And those small amounts of proteins can be metabolized by microbes. So lots of microbes like to digest fiber, but there are some bacteria that prefer protein in terms of metabolism. So I like to say that your gut micro, uh, your gut microbes are picky eaters. Some prefer certain types of fibers, some prefer certain types of proteins. And so as you know, in North America, we eat a lot of animal products. And so more protein passes through our guts undigested and fuels the microbes that prefer to digest that. And higher protein diets appear to produce compounds that may be pro-inflammatory and may also produce certain types of compounds that increase our risk of disease. In particular, one of um, the kind of bigger areas of research is around a compound called uh, trimethylamine uh, N-oxide, so TMAO for short. And what we've seen is, is in humans, uh, patients that consume more animal products uh, have a higher abundance of bacteria that produce this TMAO compound. And having higher amounts of TMA, TMAO is associated with cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk. We also see a reduction in um, core species that we consider, you know, healthy in a microbiome, which includes things like uh, Roseburia and Bifidobacteria. So those are bacteria that are thought of as health promoting or producing those beneficial compounds. And we see a reduction as protein intakes increase. And so when it comes to protein, I think a lot of times you see online and in the media, it's kind of that all or nothing message. Right. And I think for people that are carnivores, that's kind of like, oh, what? I'm not supposed to eat protein anymore? Uh, yeah. That's you know, a staple. Uh, and so for me, really, when it comes down to helping patients, it's ultimately about you know reducing intakes where we can and focusing on adding in maybe more of those plant proteins as opposed to you know cutting out all animal proteins, if that's something you enjoy. Yeah, I, I really like that because you know, I think... When the American Gut Project first launched, it's almost like had this knee jerk reaction that you know we we need to just go all fiber, you know, almost be vegan, and then you know that kind of set us on set us into a, an imbalance in some ways, and a lot of people just don't feel well eating that way, and so mm -hmm. it's nice to hear your message of looking for more balance. And, you know, to, to kind of bring these words, worlds together and create an ecosystem that includes a little bit of both. Yeah, absolutely. And I think ultimately, like, you know your body best. 
like I said at the beginning, I have irritable bowel syndrome and eating a vegan diet won't work for me. Um, And so I'm able to make small, meaningful changes to my diet to include plant-based proteins. Uh, But I also strike that balance with foods I enjoy, which includes animal proteins. And so for some people, a vegan diet works. For some people, um, you know, more animal proteins works, but we want to focus on what we can add in. So if we can get in some of those plant-based proteins, if we can get in fiber, if we can get in more whole foods, then likely we're doing a really good job. Yeah. And I think research shows us if we do make like wholesale nutritional changes, we can actually see the microbiome shift. Um, Let's take like a practical example. If someone went carnivore, um, Mm -hmm. how, what, what would you expect to see? Would you, would you see a microbiome shift or is that sort of too soon to say? Yeah, so you definitely would in the first like three days. Uh, the microbiome changes rapidly um, in response to what we feed it. It's a really dynamic ecosystem that kind of makes use of what we have. And interestingly, there was a really um, great study, kind of a landmark study published in 2016. Um, and they looked at in animals how withholding Um, what's called microbiota accessible carbohydrates. So that would include our prebiotic fibers as well as other types of carbohydrates our our gut microbiome can digest, Uh, that those bacteria had to find fuel elsewhere. So they started degrading the important mucus layer in the gut, which helps to protect our gut wall and reduces that inappropriate reaction of ingested particles uh, with our immune system. And so what we see is our gut microbiota is really adaptive. It makes use of what you give it. And when you don't give it what it needs, it's going to find that fuel elsewhere. It's hungry. It has to digest other things. And so what we see in patients that consume more meat, um, we have more studies particularly looking at like a paleo group, which of course tends to be higher in animal products, but there definitely is a rapid shift in the gut microbiota. And that shift doesn't necessarily appear to be positive. Um, However, with adequate fiber and adequate variety, some of those shifts are able to be prevented. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Okay. And I think we're obviously learning more because we, we talk a lot about bacterial shifts, but we need to learn more about viral shifts and other mm-hmm. micro other organisms. Um, cause we, we don't really know the whole picture, do we? Yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, the virobiome or the, uh, virome, sorry, is, yeah. uh, very under-researched at this point. And frankly, most of our research comes from the colonic gut microbiota, but we also have a small bowel microbiota that is largely under researched and uh, gets exposed to those food particles way sooner than the colonic microbiota. So yeah. it's interesting and, to. And I want to I want to kind of push on that a little bit further because like the the sampling of the microbiota still needs to develop, right? So mm-hmm. a lot of what we're talking about is what's considered intraluminal um, mm-hmm. versus um, the the sampling from actually, you know, at the intestinal wall. Um, so is that, is that resonate with how you look at this or um, what are your thoughts about? And I, I think a lot of the research right now supports the role of the gut microbiota in particular conditions as we know it, or as we can measure it. Uh, but I'd say like, you know, our measurements are, are still crude and there's a lot more room to move in terms of understanding that ecosystem, whether it's the luminal gut microbiota or uh, the gut wall microbiota or the virome or the small bowel microbiota. And I think as we start to build out those pictures, we'll understand how they work all together. That being said, I think there's a lot we can do with the information that we have so far, given that it's starting to draw these uh, associations and correlations, um, not the best form of data, but still a form of data um, that can drive some recommendations we make for patients. Sure. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about 
the um, actionable data later on here mm-hmm. in the episode, but um, I want to continue on this thread that you've really set up really nicely for us. And um, so let, let's go further into this. So what are some other ways to influence the microbiota you just shared with us, nutritional or food mm-hmm. intake? What about probiotics? Yeah, so probiotics are interesting in that, um, you know, there's a big interest in probiotics in the media. There's a lot of different products out there. Uh, Some make accurate claims, some are a bit more questionable. Uh, But probiotics are basically live organisms that when we take in the right amounts, have a benefit to our health. And so that really differs from fermented foods, uh, which a lot of times I see as being labeled as a source of probiotics, for example, um, where, you know, bacteria are involved in the actual uh, production of the food product, but they may not actually meet that definition of probiotic. And so certain strains of probiotics can be helpful in certain conditions. And what I like to say is uh, we want to match the right strain to the right person for the right reason, meaning that there are certain conditions in which probiotics have been shown to have benefit in the right amounts, uh, but they're definitely not like a cure-all or needed for, you know, just general health. And I see a lot of people taking probiotics for general health. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you feel like they can latch into the microbiome and sort of colonize or, or are you, is your take on it that when we take a probiotic, it, you know, we swallow it and goes through our digestive tract, does its benefit and then kind of basically goes out of us? Or is Mm -hmm. it sort of, is it kind of a temporary move as long as you're taking it? And then as soon as you stop the the benefits go away? For sure. So your your um, gut is highly stable. A lot of people think, you know, um, we can make these like crazy changes to our gut microbiota with probiotics, but probiotics are actually quite transient. So you take them, they might stick around in your gut for a bit, uh, but they do very little to actually influence your microbial profile in your gut. Uh, there isn't a lot of space for them there. And So that doesn't mean they don't have benefit. When we take them uh, for the right reason, they may have specific benefits. So for example, reducing antibiotic-associated diarrhea or helping to manage the symptoms of irritable bowel bowel syndrome. Or there's a small body of evidence that certain probiotics may help reduce uh, colic in infants uh, or uh, can help with the treatment of C. diff. Uh, But outside of that, you know, there, there's very little evidence to support probiotics kind of colonizing your gut. Right. So uh, it's there more, was... of a, more of a treatment versus a cure. Yeah, absolutely. At this point, uh, that being said, there was, you know, you see in the media, this kind of wild reporting of probiotics are, you know, the Holy grail to probiotics are dangerous. And so media tends to sensationalize and kind of become alarmist about probiotics. And so a lot of times when some of that data comes out, it really is strain specific for the specific condition researched. Uh, Interestingly, there was one study that did look at the role of a multi-strain, we're going to call it like uh, not necessarily, well, some of the strains and there were probiotic. Um, And so there was, uh, the research was done where the patients were treated with antibiotics, then provided a multi-strain probiotic. And because of the antibiotics, um, because of the reduction of bacteria in the gut, there was actually kind of space in the bacterial niche in which the multi-strain probiotic was actually able to take that niche up. And it took a long time for that person's gut microbiota to go back to their baseline after antibiotics plus this multi-strain product. Um, And so that created a lot of kind of sensationalism in the research and, you know, should we be using uh, probiotics with antibiotics? But again, I like to remind people that it's uh, strain specific And we don't know how different products behave in the gut in terms of colonization after antibiotics. Uh, But we do know that 
taking the right strain of probiotic with antibiotics can reduce antibiotic associated diarrhea. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I'd say it's, you know, person to person dependent as to whether, uh, probiotics are appropriate. Uh, but a lot of times they can be helpful in really specific conditions, as long as we take a look at the person's whole case. Yeah. It seems like it's just sort of a favorite topic amongst even in my profession, but even gastroenterologists that I speak, speak with is should you take probiotics with your antibiotic course? Should you take them after? Should you wait two weeks? Should you only take, um, a yeast based probiotic with your antibiotics? It's like, this is evolving this, this topic. Um, I'm trying to figure out the right way to do this from your, in your kind of community of colleagues, what's the general recommendations with probiotics? Do you take them after the course, two weeks after the course? What's, what's, what are you hearing? Yeah. Uh, the research that I'm familiar with is during the course of antibiotics to prevent or reduce antibiotic associated diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Um, so like a yeast based probiotic isn't susceptible to the antibiotic. So you can take it whenever, which is convenient. Uh, of course, if you're taking your, uh, bacteria based probiotic, you kind of want to space it out. Usually in the hospital, we did it two hours before, two hours after, uh, antibiotics to make sure that, um, in theory, those, those probiotics don't get killed off by the antibiotic. Um, and then in terms of the most appropriate patients for me, it really comes down to a person's individual symptom. So I have IBS C, uh, IBS constipation. Uh, if I'm on an antibiotic, I don't necessarily have that worry of getting that antibiotic associated diarrhea. Uh, My bowels are slow. And so a patient, however, that has IBSD and is really worried about going on an antibiotic for, let's say they have like a a tooth infection or something. Um, In that case, if it's going to cause them a lot of urgency, a lot of stress, a lot of diarrhea and impact their quality of life, that's probably a great patient to use a probiotic with during antibiotics. So that's kind of how I make my case-by-case decisions is really based on the patient's need and the patient's gut. Okay. That's, that's a really good point um, to tailor it and, and adapt versus having just like a standard recommendation. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, So when we come into the world, you know, we're sort of given this microbiota based on a number of factors and you and I were talking before we got on the episode about how important it is to understand that the microbiome ages. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk with you about that because, you know, the minding the microbiota would kind of give us a sense that about taking care of our microbiome so that it, it is um, working in our favor um, as we get older. So take us through sort of the aging process from birth to older age and some of the factors that we might think about in preventing um, improper aging of our microbiome. Yeah. So we kind of say your gut microbiota uh, starts its development uh, from the time you are born. There's some cool new research coming out that mom's microbiota actually influences baby's microbiota by way of how she feeds her microbiota uh, during gestation. But for the most part, you know, your gut microbiota starts to be colonized from birth. And so the first three years of your life, your microbiota is kind of developing. It's not very stable and it's rapidly changing. Uh, But as we get into three years of age and older, our gut microbiota becomes fairly stable. And it's influenced by things like nutrition, breastfeeding, skin-to-skin contact, where you grow up, your environment, your lifestyle, oral care, antibiotic exposure, stress, all of those sorts of things influence the development of our gut microbiota. And so a lot of people are really interested in what happens to the gut microbiota as we age, because it's stable through adulthood. And then as we start to age or as we become more frail, um, we see changes in the gut microbiota. So changes um, with decreases in what we'd consider good bacteria and increases in what we currently consider to be quote unquote bad bacteria, as well as decreases in diversity and abundance of bacteria. 
And we see that some of these changes are driving or part uh, participating in low-grade chronic inflammation. Uh, and that's a big driver of some of those age-related diseases like dementia, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, um, you know, chronic diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers, all of those sorts of things. And so researchers are really curious, you know, how can we prevent this age-related decrease in the gut microbiota or this age-related change of the gut microbiota? And so ultimately, what we're kind of seeing is, is the gut microbiota or not taking care of your gut microbiota likely plays a role in um, premature aging. So for all of you people thinking, you know, I'm going to start taking care of my gut microbiota and stay young forever, um, we still age, but hopefully we can age in a healthy way and in a way that prevents that frailty and reduces that low-grade chronic inflammation that occurs as we age. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Oh, yeah, definitely. And so there's there's a couple species I know that are looked at as far as markers of of an aging microbiome or how how well the microbiome's holding up. Can you talk about the I think like Acromansia is yeah. one of them. Yeah, Acromansia is one, uh, Bifidobacteria is another. Um, sometimes we look at that uh, Bacteroidetes to the Firmicutes ratio. Um, there's a couple of species that we've uh, kind of identified as, you know, the, the core species that we see that reduction in. And so these good bacteria, the Acromansia, the Bifidobacteria, all play a role in helping to produce those compounds that minimize or reduce inflammation, as opposed to some of those other species that may actually be drivers of inflammation. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, there's, there's a few proposed mechanisms when it comes to, um, comes to that, uh, aging or premature aging by way of the gut microbiota. Most of them have been studied in mice, uh, but we do see, you know, that reduction in those short chain fatty acids or those postbiotic compounds. Uh, we also see an uh, increase in those pro-inflammatory bacteria. And with that, uh, the lipopolysaccharides that um, also drive uh, age-dependent inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, in humans, we don't have a ton of great data yet, but there was a really great study that just came out of Paul O'Toole's lab in Cork. Uh, they do a lot of research around aging in the gut microbiota. And they found that a Mediterranean diet not only influenced the gut microbiota, but also increased short chain fatty acids, uh, decreased CRP and other inflammatory marker markers, improved frailty and improved con cognitive function. So these were two groups of frail elderly. One group got fed a Mediterranean diet every day for a year. They really, you know, hit the jackpot in terms of getting their food delivered, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. And then the other group maintained their uh, typical, um, you know, European diet, we'll say. And so really diet, even if there's already those changes related to the gut microbiota um, in regards to age, help to kind of prevent and almost reverse some of those, some of those outcomes. Yeah. So when we talk about things that may harm the microbiome, you know, I think it's important to mention, and maybe you, you can comment on this, is that you know, we're sort of in positions throughout our life where we have to take antibiotics or you know, we might need to be put on a medication that might, need, might not be the best for our microbiome, but more about being mindful of these decisions so that we're not doing them just you know, from a standpoint of... Um, without thinking about the impact it might have on our overall longevity or our health. And also thinking about when we're putting foods in our body that that might be protective of our microbiome, just you know, again, being mindful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think, you know, I always say we want to consider judicious use of medications. And what I mean by that is, is some medications are essential. Like I got cellulitis on the back of my arm from a vaccine I got for traveling and uh, I needed to go on antibiotics. 
And so that was absolutely necessary, but there are things I could do to take care of my gut microbiota during that time. Uh, of course, you know, back in the day when you had a sore throat or a cold, we'd go to the doctor and antibiotics would be prescribed without checking to make sure it was even a bacterial infection first. Or some of my patients get stuck long term on proton pump inhibitors and nobody ever stops to kind of take a step back and say, huh, do we still need this? Is it still providing benefit? Are there other ways we can manage that don't require pharmacological medications? So I always encourage my patients to get their medications reevaluated, really understand the purpose of their medications. Um, and then at least on a six month to yearly basis, chat with your doctor, your pharmacist about what the medication is doing for you. Do you still need to be on it? Is that the right dose? Um, and kind of reevaluate that. Great. Thanks for pointing that out. So you speak with people about their diet and I'm sure your staff also goes into details about planning and foods to choose. When you're mm -hmm. thinking about your favorite microbiome friendly foods, what are some of your favorites? Yeah. So interestingly, uh, the research not only points to plant-based foods, but also variety. So it's really hard for me to narrow down one particular food. I'd say in, in terms of getting people outside their comfort zone, I really like to encourage people to learn how to cook with pulses. So that's your chickpeas, beans, peas, and lentils. And I don't know about your community, but you know, where I'm from, Alberta, we are like a beef province all the way. So not very many people are familiar, even though we're one of the largest exporters of lentils in the world. Um, not very many people are familiar with cooking with these things. So I like to encourage people to try to include half a cup of pulses a week to start. And so people ask me, you know, Andrea, how do I do that? And so I usually encourage people to start with canned just because it's simpler. There's no cooking. There's no soaking. There's no waiting involved. Uh, canned, rinsed, drained, chickpeas, beans, peas, and lentils work great. One of my favorite subs um, would be subbing out half of any recipe with ground meat for half lentils. Uh, so I'll take my can of rinsed, drained lentils, and I'll use half ground meat in tacos or soups or stews or casseroles as a way to up our intake of pulses um, and make that transition a little bit easier. I have some picky eaters in my house, so I have to find that compromise sometimes mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Uh, other really great options people are familiar with are things like chilies and soups and stews that include these things. But there's lots of fun ways to include it in, you know, salads and mixed dishes and as an alternative to meat too. Uh, so that's a really great place to start for people looking to get a bit more variety, fiber, phytochemicals in their diet. Right. And people with digest certain digestive problems like IBS or SIBO or... Um, you know, other dysbiotic conditions, you know, might need guidance on how to incorporate pulses, yeah. right? Some of my patients ultimately aren't able to do that at the point that they're at in their condition. But that means that we can look to other foods that they may tolerate better. That being said, um, low fermentable carbohydrate pulses include things specifically like chickpeas and lentils, there's a little bit less of that fermentable carb in a serving in like a quarter cup, a half a cup. And the canning process actually breaks down some of those fermentable carbohydrates. So that does uh, some of the work there. When it comes to my SIBO patients, you know, beans may not be the best place to start, but there may be some other things that we can do that are a bit more tolerable. Um, ultimately, sometimes some of my patients aren't able to hit their fiber targets. And so we do look to incorporating in other sources of fiber that are maybe not so fermentable or ferment a lot more slowly um, by way of supplements as well. And so if you, if you have that fiber gap, um, fiber supplements can be helpful in those particular situations. So if possible, I always say food first. Gotcha. How about polyphenols? 
Yeah, polyphenols. Oh, I love this topic. Um, I'm I'm really interested in polyphenols. I'm also really interested in red wine. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so basically, you know, there's over twenty thousand food chemicals, lots of which we haven't even identified in food, and all of which probably interact with our gut microbiota on some level. However, one of the most um, kind of well-known uh, food chemicals is polyphenols. And polyphenols are found in our dark purple, dark red, dark blue fruits primarily, and then a few vegetables. And so polyphenols are compounds that we don't really absorb that well. So they make our way their way through the gut and they appear to have prebiotic-like effects in the gut. So they don't qualify as prebiotics, but they're available to fuel your gut microbiota and they appear to fuel good bacteria. Uh, specifically, uh, Ackermansia, which we kind of touched on, um, is one of those bacteria that we see has an impact on diabetes risk, cardiovascular disease, and maintaining a healthy weight. And so we see primarily in uh, rat studies that um, mice that are fed a higher polyphenol diet have a major increase in abundance of this acromantia bacteria. And so acromantia is responsible for creating a really nice uh, mucus layer in the gut. They're mucus degraders. So they kind of act as kind of custodians for the mucus layer in your colon and take care of it. And by fueling them well, and by having a more abundant uh, population of those, there's been the associations drawn between some of those chronic conditions I mentioned. And so how can you get those in? Uh, brightly colored uh, fruits and veg. So your berries, you want to think about grapes, um, plums with dark purple skins, blueberries, raspberries, uh, blackberries, all of those sorts of things have polyphenols. Uh, wine also has polyphenols, but of course, alcohol can be a gut irritant for people. Uh, so, you know, if you do consume alcohol and you enjoy the red wine, not a bad choice in moderation. But of course, I like patients primarily to focus on the, the fruit aspect of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, I'd like to add olive oil, right? It's a good source of polyphenols. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, I think. I believe it's a different kind of polyphenols than the ones that specifically the acromantia break down, but mm -hmm. I'd actually need to double check in particular because I know they're just starting to look into the role fats play in influencing mm -hmm. our gut microbiota. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, this has been very helpful. I really appreciate how you've taken us through the microbiota like you have and I'd love to just get a few take-home messages from you. And then also from there, if you could just share about what you're up to professionally and how people could follow your work and get in touch with you if need be. Sure. So I think the number one takeaway as uh, saying I've borrowed from Dr. Colin Hill is you get the microbiota you deserve. So you are really truly the custodian of those bacteria in your gut. And what you do to take care of that gut not only influences your health, but it's going to influence future generations. So you pass on that gut microbiota to your kids and your grandkids. And so it's, it's not just for you that we're taking care of it. And so in terms of taking care of it, we don't want to just think about nutrition. Nutrition is a key part, but we also want to think of exercise, sleep, stress, uh, proper use of medications, and really consider how our whole lifestyle influences the gut microbiota. Um, nutrition science, you know, isn't necessarily changing because of the gut microbiota research, but it's kind of enhancing it because we now understand a little bit deeper about the mechanism. So I like to encourage my patients to aim for uh, half a plate or about two cups of veg at lunch and supper every day. Uh, try to choose whole grains when you can. Aim for 30 different plant-based foods a week. It sounds like a lot, but jot them down. Everything from your whole grain pasta to your kale to your strawberries all counts. Um, and then, 
you know, make sure that you're trying to reduce your intake of uh, red and processed meats um, simply by including plant-based protein. You know, start with once a week and see how that goes. We don't need to make this wild and crazy change right off the bat. We can just start with those small, meaningful changes. So those are my tips. And in terms of where you can find me, uh, Adam and I were actually just talking. I recently launched a podcast as well. It's called Let's Gut Real. And we are focused on easy to digest nutrition science, all about you and your gut. So you can find that on Apple iTunes, or you can find it on andreahardyrd.com. I also run a private practice here in Alberta at ignitenutrition.ca. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time and for your expertise. This has been very helpful. I learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners did as well. And it'll be interesting to touch base with you periodically as as we learn more, you know, down the road, because this is certainly, you know, sort of the frontier for microbiota research. And so every year we will learn way more than we know Mm -hmm. now. Absolutely. It's expanding quickly. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And uh, thanks again for being here. Thanks for tuning in to the Minding Your Microbiota episode with Andrea Hardy. Please share this episode with your friends and loved ones, patients, doctors. Let's get this information out there so that we can enhance our knowledge. There is not enough information in this space, in my opinion, to justify the need and the demand that's out there. So you may think that people have heard this information, but I guarantee you there is someone out there that could benefit from understanding how to enhance GI health and improve our nutrition and reduce risk of chronic disease. I'm hoping you're enjoying the One Thing podcast as much as I am. And I look forward to speaking with you in further episodes. Please visit our website, www.soundintegrative.com, as we do have a blog and we'll have a link to show notes periodically up on that website. Thanks again, and we'll speak to you next time.